Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today we'll read from a book titled The Other Modern Movement, Architecture 1920-1970 by Kenneth Frampton, published by Yale University Press. In the international style, 1932, Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson advanced the thesis that modern architecture was a lightweight structure as removed from tradition as from other sociocultural considerations. For Hitchcock and Johnson, it was an exclusively aesthetic, apolitical manifestation. In contrast to the European avant-garde, they were more concerned with the appearance than with the substance, as is evident from the fact that although the work of Frank Lloyd Wright was prominently featured in their contemporaneous exhibition staged at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the same year, it was apparently too idiosyncratic to be included in their polemical documentation of a seemingly universal style. Despite their commitment to a similar modern ethos, the architects featured in this anthology were selected not only for their sensitive articulation of a subtly nuanced architecture, but also for their typological formulation of entirely unprecedented modernizing programs. In each instance, their reflexive interpretation of functionalism is a key aspect, as is their non-rhetorical approach to the organization of a new way of life. Perhaps the most singular limitation of this anthology, despite its ostensible worldliness, is its undeniable Eurocentric bias. This is due in part to the fact that modern architecture in Europe was from the outset seen as a socio-technical movement rather than a style. This accounts for Otto Wagner's coinage of the term moderne Bewegun, which is the idea of a movement that first appears in his book Moderne Architektur, 1896. The idea of another modernity, however, as opposed to the doctrinaire functionalism of the interwar years, 1918-1939, was the subject of a colloquium entitled Mensch und Raum, held in Darmstadt in 1951. On this occasion, Hans Scharun's less uh, maximizing functionalism was presented to the assembly in the form of a freely planned school projected for Darmstadt. It is possibly no accident that this organic work should be paralleled on the same occasion by the first public presentation of Martin Heidegger's ontological thesis Bauen, Fonen, Denken building, dwelling, thinking. Thirty years later, the idea of an alternative modernity surfaced again under entirely different circumstances, most notably in Paolo Portuguese's postmodern Venice Biennale in 1980, presented under the slogan The End of Prohibition and the Presence of the Past. This ostensibly international but largely transatlantic exhibition promulgated a populist pastiche manner that effectively reduced architecture to little more than a reactionary mise-en-scene. Such a demagogic dead end was categorically rejected by the latter-day Frankfurt School philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who, in his opening address at the exhibition Die Andere Tradition, staged in Munich in 1982, argued that modern architecture could still contribute to the evolution of society in a critically liberative manner. In doing so, he returned to his lifelong insistence on the enduring challenge of the unfinished modern project. Martin Steinman and Claude Liechtenstein joined the debate with their 1985 exhibition Di Andre Moderne, dedicated to the work of the Swiss modernist Otto Rudolf Salvisberg. In their catalogue essay, Steinman and Liechtenstein characterized the work of Salvisberg as another modernity, which, while employing many of the tropes of the international style, nonetheless created a popular and accessible civic architecture, comparable to Eric Mendelssohn's department stores of the 1930s. A decade later, in 1995, Collins and John Wilson published their polemical essay the other tradition in modern architecture, in which he aligned himself with the humanist discourse of Alvar Aalto's 1957 address to the Royal Institute of British Architects, bringing the whole question of an alternative modern architecture closer to the position already formulated by Hans Scharun before the Second World War. 
By enjoining the issue of another modernity, I have attempted to evoke through this anthology a richly inflected architectural modernity capable of contributing through its expressive range to the wider liberative aims of the modern movement. Despite the subjectivity inherent in every anthology, two criteria determine the selection of the architects included here. The first of these turned on the relative marginality of each protagonist when compared to the acknowledged masters of 20th century architecture, such as Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. The second criterion depended on the degree to which each architect could be seen as consciously contributing to the production of a new typology, one that is capable of meeting the demands of unprecedented programs. In each instance, I have attempted not only to focus on a single exemplary work, but also to provide the developmental background of each architect, thereby indicating the place that this work occupies in the career of each figure. This endeavor seeks to represent, uh, in architectural terms, not only the potential of the unfinished modern project, but also its inherent diversity, notwithstanding the fact that we live in an era in which the tradition of the new is overwhelmed by an ever-escalating rate of technological change. The otherness represented in this survey arises from identifying buildings that often depart in subtle ways from functionalism. The works of these architects may be seen as having been both marginal and canonical at the same time, marginal in the sense that they were designed by figures whose reputation at the time of their conception was hardly assured, and canonical in the sense that each exemplary building involves the sensitive formulation of a newly differentiated program in a syntactically elaborate form. Since no survey can be of infinite extent, one is confronted with the contradiction of including certain works while excluding others. There is also an arbitrary cutoff at both the beginning and the end of the chronological sequence. Hence, there remain many so-called marginal architects whose works could be said to have played salient roles in the evolution of 20th century architecture who are not included here for a variety of reasons. Either because I felt that their overall careers were not sufficiently significant, or because I could not find in their production a single piece that seemed sufficiently canonical. As for the Bocatier Local Bookstore, thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye!